Well, this would have been more appropriate a couple of weeks ago when we were having all that rain and flooding in Colorado to, to deal with the great with the great flood story. <clears throat> well, I really struggle this week. The, the great flood story is very complex, and it's uh, got uh, a lot of confusing parts to try to unravel. But <clears throat> before I actually get there, I, I missed a couple of things uh, in that list of the, the patriarchs before the flood that I wanted to, uh, to not miss. One of our scholars, Vauter, spent several pages discussing the history of the list and numbers uh, that compared with other ancient uh, texts than from the Babylonian uh, stories uh, and the lead up to their flood story as well. And he sums up that uh, the biblical authors are using the numbers for the ages and how long people lived. And when uh, the first son, who was uh, the first of the next generation, then all of these added up to the number of years from creation to the flood. So they made sure when they got to um, <clears throat> that number that they had carefully worked those numbers for those generations so that it came out right. Uh, the oldest and the longest living Methuselah dies right before the flood. Now, I think I told you last week I'd read someplace, somebody didn't count the numbers right, and they said Methuselah had to be on the ark because he lived past when the flood began. <laughs> uh, but anyway, whoever whoever put that down had, had miscounted. So... Uh, Anyway, I thought that was an interesting little Bible trivia, so I remembered it, and now I have to go in and erase that memory. <laughs> uh, but all, Vodder also says that the Hebrew author, the Yahwist, was uh, careful with his numbers to show that all the patriarchs had died of natural causes of old age before the flood so that none of them got killed in the flood to indicate that somehow they were part of the corruption and the evil. So they had to have died naturally. So that's why we have Methuselah dies and then the flood begins as far as uh, those dates. I also failed to mention a point about uh, Enoch in the, in the genealogy. Uh, of the pre-flood patriarchs. It says, Enoch, father of Methuselah, lived only 365 years on earth, but he did not die. It doesn't say he died. And then it, it does, instead it says, then Enoch walked with God and was no longer here, for God took him. Now, those lines have led to lots of speculation and lots of spin over the years, uh, but in comparison with the other figures in these other creation myths in Babylon and, and Samaria and Akkadia and so forth, the heroes in the Babylonian flood story, uh, and looking at them, Enoch did not gain special powers or special favors uh, and in, in he did not become not divine. It, uh, it's explaining that this is uh, just a patriarch was faithful and righteous, and he walked with God, and he lived in intimate communion with God. Is is what that's trying to say. Um, now we're not sure why. Why was that stuck in there? You know, whenever the author puts something there. Uh, they have some reason they put it there, but we're not sure. So we can speculate. Uh, some of the speculation has has made it uh, into um, some of the apocryphal literature that somehow Enoch was somehow special and then God was going to use him and give him special knowledge and stuff. But that's not in, in this text. So in a way, it may be one way of showing that God was not a complete failure in this try, that there really were some good people, that uh, and Enoch was one who was completely righteous 
and then Noah was was not bad either. He was righteous, um, and he walked with God. Then uh, in uh, 528, uh, Lamech was 182 years, and he begat Noah in order to kind of hear some of the different ways Noah came to us, uh, saying, Out of the very ground that the Lord has put under a curse, this one shall bring us relief from our work and the toil of our hands. Now, we're not sure how that was supposed to be fulfilled. It doesn't... There's nothing that says that because then everybody's going to die except Noah. So how's he going to bring relief for the rest of the folks? Uh, That one leaves uh, a big question mark out there. What was the tradition that that was a part of and what happened to it? We we don't know. And then uh, in 532, then it says, When Noah was 500 years old, he became father to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And and then uh, and then we get into for I was sorry I made them part the grieving of God and then but Noah found favor in the sight of God in that context and then it goes off and then says these are the descendants of Noah and Noah was a righteous man blameless in his generation Noah Noah walked with God and Noah had three sons uh, anyway part of this is just the melding of of the Yahweh's tradition and the priestly tradition they are coming up. Um, But one reflection on that, uh, Vauter says, in one sense, God decides to not let the innocent perish with the guilty. When God is grieving, the whole human race is terrible, it's gone to pot, and it looks like God is angry. I'm going to destroy the whole thing, I give up. But then... We have this, but all of a sudden, just bleep, Noah. But Noah found favor. And um, so why, why does it do that? Well, one of the suggestions is because um, this idea that God will not let the innocent perish with all the guilty. Um, and, um, and that's the the point of Abraham arguing with God about Sodom. Will you destroy the righteous with all the unrighteous? So it's it's a a little bit of that theme. It's not spelled out here, but it's it's a a hint to that. Uh, the other part is we don't know about Adam's sons so often like Eli's son and Samuel in other parts of the Bible this very holy righteous person has these awful sons or awful children. Uh, and we don't know if Noah's kids were good or not, or the, the wives. You know, there's no explanation about their righteousness or goodness. It just says Noah. But, so why do they get to go along except to start over again? But, but um, another thing, theme that that can be uh, there is that um, there's redemptive value in one person's righteousness not for their own sake but for the sake of others because Noah is righteous and God decides to save him and use him then his family is blessed and benefited because of his righteousness. So it's the redemptive value of one good person, one good person can be shared by others and have influence that extends beyond that person's life and and touch others and help others just by the virtue of their goodness uh, brings good things to others. Anyway, it's not spelled out, but it just it's hinted uh, there as one of the one of the possible things. Now, um, the flood story is borrowed 
I mean, the, the gist of it is, is borrowed from, from other places. And uh, understanding Genesis from uh, the heritage of the biblical Israel from Nahum M. Sarna, uh, a Hebrew scholar, um, gives one of the better explanations of, of how this uh, came about. Uh, there are, basically they're feeling like there was, an, and Spencer asked about it, uh, Spencer Brown asked about it a couple of weeks ago, you know, was there a flood uh, somewhere that may have been the inspiration for this? And uh, Sarna and others think that it came out of uh, Mesopotamia where between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, there were rivers there, and as we know, rivers flood periodically. There's the 100-year flood, or the 500-year flood, or the 50-year flood, and people experience devastating floods. So, <clears throat> as can happen, when people are remembering and talking about the great flood, it takes on legendary dimensions. It gets bigger. I remember um, when I was, well, I wasn't out of seminary. I took an internship when I was uh, in, um, in New York City, and I went all the way out to Montana to do an intern year, um, and it was at uh, Fairfield and Power, Montana. Now, I'd never been way up north before, particularly not in the winter time, and uh, that was fun. We had uh, 40 below zero weather on, uh, on some days, and uh, I even went out, and this, this is interesting, I went out in my shirt sleeves and shoveled off the church walk in 40, belie- 40 degrees below zero weather, and I was perfectly comfortable. Because the wind wasn't blowing. It was a dry cold. And I was exercising. I was burning some calories. Um, but, uh, but it was really cold. You had to put uh, head bolt heaters in your car. Anybody ever had a head bolt heater? If you have it, it, it looks like a little battery that's got wires in it, and it's just a little heater that circulates the water uh, through the engine. And then others had dipstick heaters that heat the oil um, that, that helps. And, and they even had, uh, in some places, you could, you know, little outlets at the parking meters where you could plug in your head bolt heater. Um, anyway... <clears throat> But out there, they had some stories of the great blizzard and how, you know, the six foot high and then it was 10 feet high and 12 feet high and it covered the whole house. And uh, and in actuality, the way some of the stories went, in a sense, they were true in that a drift may have gotten that high and covered everything, but it didn't snow that much to cover everything that deep. So the legends kind of, just to make a good story, we exaggerate and and extrapolate on it. Well, they really think that the beginning of the flood stories among all the cultures uh, around that area were fairly common because there there are several uh, in in the legends, but the most uh, famous uh, was uh, from from Mesopotamia and uh, the uh, Epic of, of Gilgamesh, and and in this story it it really was just a part of the bigger story of of Gilgamesh, and it was like three thousand years. Old and it had been traveled all over, and it was in different languages, um, and and a part of uh, part of the story is uh, uh, well. Let me find the if 
find out. The Epic of Gilgamesh constitutes one of the major literary achievements of the ancient world. In its final form, as known to us, it is really a fusion of several originally independent poems and all of the most important elements we can trace uh, back to the Sumerian literature uh, in the third millennium before the common era. But it had Hittite and Hurrian renderings, and uh, I think the original was Akkadian. And uh, anyway, Gilgamesh had a good buddy, Enkidu, and Enkidu dies, and Gilgamesh is all torn up, and he's just realizing that he too is, is mortal, and he goes searching for uh, an answer to the problem of his mortality and searching for immortality. And, uh, and then he finds out that there is uh, someone who's supposed to be immortal, and this person is immortal because he happened to have survived the great flood, and he goes to this person to find out how he can be immortal as well, and that's where in the Epic of Gilgamesh it comes up with that person telling about the great flood that he had survived and how the gods had awarded him and his wife eternal life because they were the survivors of that great flood. But there are um, many parts of that story that are very similar uh, to, uh, to our story. And I had a copy of that. And I laid it down and covered it up. Oh. Um, And I've got a copy of it too. And I I was flipping through and I found some of the uh, some of the the lines that that are similar uh, where uh, only on, on this one He's, uh, he's, he's built it, and it's a big square uh, structure made out of, uh, let's see, um, he says, When the first light of dawn appeared, the country gathered about me, and the carpenter brought me his axe, and a reed worker brought his stone, and young men, children carried the bitumen, and the poor fetched what was needed, and on the fifth day I laid down her form, uh, one acre was her circumference, ten poles each the height of her walls. Uh, her top edge was likewise ten poles all around. I laid down her structure, drew it out, gave her six decks, divided her into seven. Her middle I divided into nine, drove water pegs into the middle. I saw the paddles and put down what was needed. Uh, three sar of bitumen I poured into the kiln, three sar of pitch I poured into the inside, three sar of oil they fetched, and the workmen who carried the baskets, now counting, anyway, it goes on. Um, and then once he gets it built, uh, he said, I loaded her with everything there was. I loaded her with all the silver. I loaded her with all the gold. I loaded her with all the seed of living things, all of them, all, all living things. I put on board the boat, all my kith and kin, put aboard cattle from the open country, wild beasts from the open country, all kinds of craftsmen, shamash and the fix the hour in the morning cakes and darkness and the evening rain of wheat, heaviness. Uh, I sh- shall shower, shower down. Enter into the boat and shut the door. The hour arrived. And then I went on board the boat and closed the door. To seal the door, I handed over the floating place with her cargo. And then it goes on and on. And then, uh, and then it says, uh, and then it goes on, and all the waters had come, and even the gods were afraid of the flood weapon. Uh, they withdrew, and they went up to heaven. Uh, the gods cowered like dogs, crouched by the outside wall. And then it, and then for, it skips down, then six days and seven nights, the wind blew, the flood and the tempest overwhelmed the land. When the seventh day arrived, the tempest, flood, and onslaught, which had struggled like a woman in labor, blew themselves out. The sea became calm. Uh, I looked at the weather. Silence reigned. 
for all mankind had returned to clay, meaning all everybody had been drowned and it was it was dead. Um, and then and the boat came to rest on Mount Nimush. And when the seventh day arrived, I put out and released a dove. And the dove went, and it came back, for no perching place was visible to it, and it turned around. I put out and released a swallow. The swallow went, and it came back, for no purchasing place was visible to it, and it turned around. I put out and released a raven. The raven went and saw the waters receding, and it ate, preened, and lifted its tail, and did not turn around. Then I put everything out to the four winds." And I made a sacrifice. Uh, Anyway, and then the gods smelt the fragrance. The gods smelt the pleasant fragrance of the sacrifice. The gods, like flies, gathered over the sacrifice. Um, Anyway, so those are lines that sound similar uh, to to our story. And... um, But even in our story, we've got, uh, as I said, uh, the, there's a blending of the two Yahwist and priestly version. And like I said, this was very difficult. I kept reading over this and reading the commentaries and seeing this. And it was very difficult to sort it out because there were lots of contradictions. Um, but... This uh, scholar, E.A. Spicer, had done something for me. Others had done, they had separated them out, but he made little marks of where this part is the Yahweh's version and this part is the priestly version. And so to, you can see where the, uh, the redactor had taken the two and put them together. Now, one of the things that I think I've I've said this before, these ancient uh, writers who were compiling this looked at their sources were holy scripture to them. And even though they were working with it and kind of basically doing a cut and paste job on this material to bring it together, they they held it sacred and holy, and they didn't amend it to make it concise. They didn't eliminate the contradictions. They just left them, but kind of put them to get the flow of the story. Um, and some of the things may have been lost from their resources. Um, don't really think that they just cut out and left out some material because of this uh, way of honoring the text and and not amending it. I don't think they just say, well, we'll throw that away. So I'm suspecting that probably these were the sources they had and they weren't complete and they were doing the best they could to pull it together. Uh, But the redactor does have his own message uh, that we get from this, and that is, as I said before, everything has gotten so bad, the heart of God is broken and grieved that it's gotten bad. Essentially, God is saying, I give up on you, I'm going to destroy it, and then I'm going to start all over. I'm going to try again, and that's kind of the way way the story line goes. Uh, but I'm going to read to you first the Yahwist. If you've been reading and read the whole thing before, uh, anybody done that, read ahead, studied ahead? How many hands? I just see. That's what I tell my son to do. (laughs) Read ahead. So when you get to class, what you hear is reinforced by what you've read. And that gets it in there better. But if you go to class and you hear the lecture and you haven't read it, then it's not quite getting in there. 
Now, but you don't really have to worry about that because I'm not giving you the final exam. And you don't have to worry about the grade from me. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we... <clears throat> that's... that's uh, okay. The Yahwist story. When Yahweh saw how great was man's wickedness on earth and how... Oh, this is beginning in uh, 6.5. Um, wickedness on earth and how every scheme that his mind devised was nothing but evil all the time. And Yahweh regretted that he had made man on earth and there was sorrow in his heart... And Yahweh said, I will blot out from the earth the men that I created, man and beast, the creeping things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found favor with Yahweh. And then the priestly verses at 9 through 22. <clears throat> but picking up at 7-1... And it, and it flows so well, but Noah found favor with Yahweh, and then Yahweh said to Noah, since he found favor with him, Go into the ark, you and your household, for you alone have I found to be truly righteous in this age. Of every clean animal, take seven pairs. Now, how many knew about seven pairs? We've always heard two by two, two by two, seven pairs. Now, before I had done this study, I thought, obviously, that's the priestly version. Because when they get to the end and they have to have a sacrifice, you don't want to sacrifice your only two, because then they're extinct. So you have to have extra. Wrong. This is the Yahwist version. I think maybe the reason is the priestly version understands you don't build an ark somewhere else and have a sacrifice. You go to church. You go to the temple where we are in charge of doing the sacrifices. So that's just... That's a freebie. I don't know if that was what's what. Anyway. Do what? Possibly. There could have been. There could have been. However, there, as we go through, we'll see there's differences in time. <clears throat> well, the Yahwist, it's 40 days. So you couldn't have a, a whole extra herd uh, well, that's true, but um, it doesn't say go out and find pregnant ones so that you'll have enough for, <laughs> for the sacrifice. And who are you going to sacrifice, the dad or the mom or the baby? Okay, anyway. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oh, then Yahweh said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your household, and, uh, and take these seven pairs of clean animals, and a male and its mate, and of the animals that are unclean, one pair, a male and its mate. But seven pairs, again, of the birds of the sky, male and female. And that's all of them, not just clean and unclean, all of them, seven pair, to preserve the issue throughout the earth. I wonder if this author was around when the starlings are gathering and realized to get that many birds flying around, we must have had extra on the ark. To... Anyway, then for seven days' time, I will cause it to rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the surface of the earth all existence that I created. Noah did just as Yahweh commanded. Now... In this version, we don't have anything about building the ark. He just says it's going to happen, and the next thing we know, get on the ark, take the animals. So, 
And then the 600 years, that's a priestly thing that slipped in there. Then Noah, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, they went inside the ark because the waters of the flood of the clean animals and the animals that are unclean, the birds of the sky, and everything that creeps on earth, two of each, male and female, came inside the ark to Noah as God had commanded. And as soon as the seven days were over, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So in seven days, it just takes seven days to flood the earth. Now down to 12. Heavy rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And it's, anyway, it floods, but we've got 40 days and 40 nights more. Duh. And then, and then this little line, then Yahweh shut him in. Meaning, God shut the door of the ark. It's going to like God taking special care. I mean, that's one of those little grace things and special care that God shut him in to protect him. Uh, Let's see. And then 40 days, as the waters increased, they bore the ark aloft so so that it rose above the earth. And then skip a few verses to 22. All in whose nostrils was the faintest breath of life, everything that had been on dry land died out. All existence on earth was blotted out. Man, cattle, creeping things, and birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. I had a young man ask me one time, nobody's asked it here, what about the fish? What about the fish? The whales, the porpoises, what? Anyway, Sharks had a feast. That's it. Something's got to clean up the ocean with all this dead material in there. The sharks and the fish have to clean it up. Anybody ever thought of that? I just did. It may be a dumb idea or a divine inspiration. Well, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so Noah was left, and though uh, let's see, okay, Noah was left, and those that were with him on the ark, and God remembered. Um, wait a minute, where's this? Uh, oh no! And the heavy rain from the sky was held back, and a little by little, the waters receded from the earth. And at the end, and then down to 8 6, at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the hatch of the ark that he had made and released a raven, and it went back and forth, waiting for the water to dry off from the earth. And then he sent out a dove to see if the waters had dwindled from the ground, but the dove could not find a place for its foot to rest on and returned to him in the ark. For there was water all over the earth, so putting out his hand, he picked it up, and he drew it inside the ark toward him. He waited another seven days, and again released the dove from the ark, and the dove returned to him toward evening, and there in its bill was a plucked olive leaf. No one knew then that the waters had dwindled from the ground. He waited yet another seven days, and released the dove once more, and it did not return to him. Skip a verse. Noah removed the covering of the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was drying. And then down to 20. Then Noah built an altar to Yahweh and choosing from every clean animal and every clean bird offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now this is from every, not just a few, from every. He offered one. As Yahweh smelled the soothing odor, he said to himself, Never again will I doom the world because of man. Now here's an interesting thing. We go back to 6.5. When Yahweh saw how great was man's wickedness on earth and how every scheme that his mind deceived was nothing but evil all the time, Then Yahweh regretted that he made man and he was going to blot him out. Now he promises 
Never again will I doom the world because of man. Why? Same reason he blotted them out. Since the devisings of man's heart are evil from the start. Anybody ever noticed that before? I didn't either. A professor pointed it out. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to dig and hunt for some of the explanations of of the scholars. But but basically, I think the Yahwist is saying, and, and this is what I said last week maybe, that... If God is going to eliminate sin from the world, God has to eliminate the sinners. Got to get rid of us. And so, if God is going to blot them all out and start all over, He's going to start over with human beings who are fallible, make mistakes, are going to have evil thoughts, and do evil deeds. There's no way of preventing that without eliminating the people. So it really seems like, you know, if this is, we get to all that and get to the end and God's going to start all over again, the same bad stuff's going to happen because you've got human beings that are fallible. And so God is promising, I'm not going to give up on them again. I'm not going to give up on them again and blot them out. I'm going to hang in there with them. And neither again will I strike down every living being as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time, harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Anyway, that's the Yahwist version. Now, Now here's, if we just do the priestly version, how it goes. Starting at uh, 6.9, this is the line of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was without blame in the age. Noah walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupt in the view of God, and it was full of lawlessness. And God saw how corrupt the earth was, for all flesh had corrupted their ways on earth. And then God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to the all flesh, for the earth is filled with lawlessness because of them. So I am about to destroy both them and the earth. Make yourself an ark. Of gopher wood, make it an ark with compartments and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall build it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, its height 30 cubits. Uh, Make a skylight for the ark, terminating it within a cubit of the top. Put the entrance in the side of the ark, which is to be made with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am about to bring on the flood, flood waters upon the earth, to eliminate everywhere all flesh in which there is breath of life. Everything on earth shall perish. But with you I will establish my covenant, and you shall enter the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives, and of all else that is alive, all flesh, you shall sh- take two of each into the ark and stay alive with you. They must be male and female, of the birds of every kind, cattle of every kind, every kind of creeping thing, two of each shall come inside with you to stay alive. For your part, Provide yourself with all the food that is to be eaten and stored away to serve as provisions for you and for them. This Noah did, just as God had commanded him, so he did. <clears throat> now part of this here uh, is, is the obedience of Noah that's lifted up. This huge task. He doesn't question, he doesn't challenge, he doesn't whine. He just accepts it and does it. 
And then uh, he did. Noah was in his 600th year when the flood came. Waters upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the sluices in the sky broke open. Some persons say the windows, the storm windows <clears throat> opened, or the floodgates. On the aforesaid day, Noah and his son Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's wife and the three wives of his son, had entered the ark, and they, as well as every kind of beast, every kind of cattle, every kind of creature that creeps on the earth, and every kind of bird, every winged thing, they came inside the ark uh, to Noah, to each of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered comprised male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded Noah. The flood came down upon the earth. The water swelled and increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark drifted on the surface of the water. The waters continued to swell more and more above the earth until all the highest mountains everywhere were submerged. And the crest reaching 15 cubits above the submerged mountains and all flesh that had stirred on the earth, perished, birds, cattle, beasts, and all the creatures that swarmed on the earth, all and all mankind. And when the waters over the earth had maintained their crest 150 days, God remembered Noah and all the beasts and the cattle and all that were with him in the ark, and God caused a wind to sweep across the earth. The waters began to subside. The fountains of the deep and the sluices in the sky were stopped up. By the end of the 150 days, the waters had diminished so that in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the Ararat range. The waters went on diminishing until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the peaks of the mountains became visible. In the 601st year of Noah's life, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the waters began to dry from the earth. So in this calculation, that's 13 months, enough to have some babies, not just 40 days. Yes, I'm reading Spicer's translation. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is, this is the scholar's... And I'm reading that because he's got the little marks that that shows which is Yahwist and which is priestly uh, by most judgment. Yeah, chapter 8, verse 13 is where this is in the 601st year of Noah's life. And then we skip uh, to Noah removing the covering of the ark and saw the surface of the ground was drying as a Yahwist line. But anyway... In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Come out of the ark, together with your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. Bring out with you every living being that is with you, all flesh, be it bird or cattle or creature or creeping things, and let them swarm on the earth and breed and increase on it. So Noah came out with sons... Um, and why now? Now that line is very familiar to us from the priestly first chapter, to fill the earth, you know, to go forth, and uh, so come out and uh, everything that stirs on earth. Anyway, uh, swarm the earth, breed and increase on it. So Noah came out with his sons and wives and his sons' wives, and every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that sits, stirs on the earth, left the ark group by group. Done. No sacrifice, or no story of sacrifice there. So now, in hearing that, I felt like it, but maybe you didn't, but it seemed like each story, as it went made a lot of sense and seemed to follow. But as they were put together, we've got 40 days here and then 150 days there. And, uh, 
and then anyway, um, I I think the scholars have uh, have have done pretty well of of sorting that out. But I have one scholar who who wants to argue with that source theory, and and in his rendering, he's saying that. As the story is now, it parallels so much better with the Epic of Gilgamesh flood story. It has all of the parts rather than a priestly or a Yahweh story. They don't jive. And so he says if they were following that story as kind of an outline to write their own story, then this was put together all at once. Um, and and that's his argument, which uh, really goes against the grain. But <laughs> but he he had a, he, he had a, made a, an interesting chart in which he said uh, order in the story, the Genesis story, the element in the story has an immoral uh, a morality and immorality factor. The Gilgamesh epic doesn't have that. It's just the gods and, you know, crazy stuff going on. <clears throat> the Yahweh version does, and he mentions it in, in uh, 6, 5 through 8, and then the priestly Elohim version has 6, 9 to 13, mentions the morality, immorality part. Uh, the materials, the pitch, the wood, the reeds, yes, it's in the Gilgamesh story, not in the Yahwist, because we don't have any building of the ark, but it's in the priestly version. The dimensions, uh, we've got dimensions and the size listed. In the Gilgamesh, yes. <clears throat> in the Yahwist, no. But in the priestly version, yes. How many decks? We've got those in the Gilgamesh story. Yahwist, no, because we're not building an ark. But priestly version, yes. A covenant and population, we don't uh, have that in the Gilgamesh story. That's a unique Hebrew inserting into the story, this relationship with God. Um, but anyway, the Yahweh doesn't mention covenant, but the priestly does. <clears throat> and then the, the population, it says uh, Gilgamesh, it's present. <clears throat> it is in the Yahweh, but not in the priestly. In the flood... Yes, on all of them, and describes them. A mountaintop landing, we've got it in the Gilgamesh story, not in the Yahwist, but it is in the priestly. Bird sent forth, it's in the Gilgamesh, it's in the Yahwist, but not in the priestly. The dry land, <clears throat> uh, it's in the Gilgamesh, it's present, but the Yahwist doesn't mention dry land uh, significantly, but it is in the priestly version. A lot of dry land mentioned there. All are set free. All are set free in the Gilgamesh, not in the Yahwist. It doesn't set them all free. It doesn't mention that, and but it is in the priestly. And the sacrifices, yes, we have the sacrifices in the Gilgamesh story and in the Yahwist story. And that's very similar. And it mentions... Uh, there that they have, uh, um, this is the only place where it mentions or has a description of God smelling the aroma of the sacrifice and finding it pleasing. Only place in the Hebrew tradition. But it's really powerful in the Gilgamesh story that's not... I mean, all the gods, it says they're gathering like flies because they smell this aroma. And so that little uh, poetic device uh, finds its way into the Yahwist uh, version. So anyway, that is a bunch of ideas and materials thrown at you. <clears throat> We've got five minutes you just scratching? You weren't raising your hand. Okay. <laughs> any thoughts? Any reflections? Any reactions? Gwen, you're always good for something. <laughs>
etc. <laughs> but if you're going to have a human being with free will, which is what God right. gave to them, you're going to have it. Exactly. It's yeah. Free will. Yeah. It's if if we're going to have free will and God's going to destroy us because we exercise our free will badly and make bad choices and get greedy and selfish and harmful. If God hadn't, hadn't, given free will. hadn't given free will, I thought if he didn't create the earth, he'd just be redecorating heaven and all those heavenly hosts. He wouldn't have messed with people. Yes, everybody would have been, but not all those heavenly creatures were. Anyway, yes, in the, the free will question... Uh, and that's part of our human nature, and it's part of what we believe is is so important about the quality and the richness of love. If it's commanded and forced, it doesn't work. Uh, oh gosh, what's that guy who kidnapped the women and kept them captive forever? And I mean, he, he thought that was love, but it wasn't. There's no way there could be anything fulfilling there when it's forced. So the the but the irony is that with the freedom you can say no. You can make bad choices. You can do harmful things. Um, and it's in the give and the take that that we learn and and we grow. But like uh, like I said, I I really believe that this story is always looking to the future and the future is that human beings need help and God is not going to abandon us we're going to get help and the way we're going to get help is that God is going to choose a particular people to be the light of the nation and then how do we get that people started and all their trial and errors of of learning to follow God is where the story is is headed but at this point it's kind of saying God just kind of turned us loose and we couldn't do it on our own we just thoroughly messed up and so God is stepping back and he's going back to the drawing board and he's trying to figure out another way to help us do this <clears throat> Now, um, like I've done with the others, um, this Naomi Rosenblatt has some very interesting takes on the creation story as story and why it speaks to us. Why do kids love Noah's Ark and that story? What's, what's with that story? Because it's terrible. I mean, this is destruction and violence and... Uh, angry God and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But why do kids love that story? What is about it? Well, anyway, I'm going to share her thoughts because they're very interesting. It gets kind of to the heart of who we are as human beings and as a culture, uh, why various cultures had a great flood story. What is it in the archetypal flood story that speaks to the human heart and human condition, uh, and especially small people. <clears throat> so, you got by my clock. I got thirty more seconds. Okay. <laughs> or were you read that? No, no, no. Not, that, that that's next week. We're okay. gonna. Okay, the question on burnt offerings. How did that get started, and why do we think the gods appreciate it? Uh, <clears throat> well, in this story, that's one of the primitive ideas why we think primitive folks felt like it worked. We heard it. God is up there somewhere. And if I'm going to give God a gift, where are those gifts? Oh, anyway... <clears throat> If I'm going to give God a gift, God, here's this pen. 
Well, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't stay up there. But I'm going to do a burnt offering. And we're going to share in the meat and have a communion here and a fellowship dinner. But God's part is the blood and the fat and the, you know, the, the aroma. And it goes up and up and up and it just it doesn't fall back down on us. So in a primitive mind, that's how we give things to God. If we just put it on the altar, well, it just stays there. Draws flies and it's nasty, but, <laughs> but this way it's it's pleasing. So they had that thought. But then uh, another part: why do we? Why is something killed and slaughtered, which seems like violence and wastefulness? We got a lot of time to deal with that. So. <clears throat> Well, it begins because it does fit because why they think he needed a burnt offering? We've never gotten that explained or started yet. And why is it the Yahwist and not the priestly version? Because that was their business. And, oh, you're just sitting here because I haven't said the prayer, right? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for inspiring these ancient followers of yours and inspired them to wrestle with your nature and, and your will for us. And they used these materials and they reworked them in ways to try to communicate that message to us that you are a God of grace and love and you do want what's good for us. And you do not give up on us and you do not squash us like a bug, but you help us and nurture us. And we are grateful. In Christ's name, amen.